Okay, there we go. Good morning, Bruce. Good morning. All right. Good morning, everyone. I am Bruce Bouch, Fire Program Specialist with the U.S. Fire Administration's National Fire Programs Prevention and Information Branch. I am very humbled by the amount of people interested in the Arson Awareness Week event this year. With all the tragic civil unrest events and the side effects thereafter, we felt this would be a very topical event to address this year. The physical and mental damage that occurs in these communities can have catastrophic events for many, many years. With that stated, the U.S. Fire Administration is pleased to bring you four dynamic presenters that each have an integral aspect of today's presentation. Firstly, I would like to thank our behind the scenes team from the National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies for implementing today's presentation on this newly developed Remo platform. We hope you like the layout and appreciate any comments you have about this program. <clears throat> With that state, well, sorry. Uh, this is our 26th year promoting Arson Awareness Week, and we are already reviewing plans for a great topic for 2022. I want to thank our partners, the National Fire Academy, National Association of State Fire Marshals, National Association of Mutual Insurance Companies, National Volunteer Fire Council, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives, the International Association of Arson Investigators, State Farm Insurance, National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, and the Coalition Against Insurance Fraud. Without their valued contributions, the National Arson Awareness Week campaign would not be where it is today. And a sincere thank you to you, our listeners, for your support of this effort in promoting these fire and life safety initiatives. And now, without further ado, I shall introduce you to our first presenter. Seth Grable has been a special agent with the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms, and Explosives since the year 2000, and a certified fire investigator for more than a decade. Grable is currently assigned as a team supervisor on the ATF National Response Team. Grable was previously assigned as a special agent certified by a fire investigator with the Philadelphia Field Division, and then to the National Fire Academy, where he provided instruction for the fire arson and explosion investigation curriculum. Grable continues to assist in conducting fire investigations for the Philadelphia Field Division and is an active member of the International Association of Arson Investigators and the Pennsylvania Association of Arson Investigators. The floor is yours, my Seth. Hey, good morning, Bruce. Thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us. Um, let me see if I can uh, get this presentation up here real quickly. I'm going to share my screen. Bear with me if I have any technical glitches. Um, I'm going to write this. Can everybody see that? Um, all right. Okay. Um, good morning, everyone. Again, uh, my name is Seth Grable. I'm one of the team leaders um, with our national response team. Uh, and thanks for joining us um, for this uh, uh, important Arson Awareness Week. Um, I have 20 minutes to go through this, uh, so I'll try to uh, add quite a bit of information to go through, and, and I'll try to uh, pace myself um, that we can fall within the uh, time constraints. If I go over, I do apologize. Um, I know uh, it, it was a busy year last year uh, with all the civil unrest, um, and the ATF uh, was, uh, played an integral role in doing a lot of these investigations. Um, uh, one of the things with the ATF I, I wanted to go over, basically, uh, that we do have uh, federal jurisdiction uh, to enforce federal arson laws. Um, and this is why we get involved with these types of investigations. Um, during, uh, well, the, uh, some of the common um, statutes that we enforce are uh, listed on your screen here. Um, it's uh, Title 18 USC 844I. So this would uh, involve somebody um, either burning or attempting to uh, burn a uh, vehicle or a uh, building um, rental property, et cetera, that would affect interstate commerce. And what we mean by interstate commerce is essentially um, uh, businesses 
that uh, receive um, products, goods, services um, from other states or their services go to other states. Uh, this could also involve maybe rental vehicles that are crossing over state uh, lines back and forth. So that would be a uh, property that affects interstate commerce. Um, that is, uh, so if somebody is uh, convicted of that, it's a mandatory minimum five years. So a uh, pretty substantial um, charge and sentence uh, that follows um, with that 844I uh, charge. And then we also have uh, Title 18 USC 844F, which is uh, the use of fire to damage a property owned, possessed, or leased by the United States of America. So this would be essentially um, a, uh, 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 an example would be a federal building um, that uh, somebody attempts to set on fire or does set on fire. Um, that's a mandatory minimum five years if convicted. Um, in the uh, Twin Cities, when the third precinct was uh, set on fire, that would be a um, agency that receives federal funding. So therefore, that would constitute an 844F charge. And we saw a lot of that around the country with um, police vehicles that had been um, set on fire. So most uh, police organizations are receiving some sort of federal financial assistance. So therefore, um, if someone was to set a police cruiser on fire, they would be open to being charged for the 844F. 844N uh, is a um, conspiracy to commit an 844 offense offense. Um, so essentially, uh, anybody that conspires with another to uh, um, set either a, a building that affects um, uh, interstate commerce or um, a, a building that's um, uh, leased or owned, possessed by the uh, federal states, uh, United States of America, um, would be open to a conspiracy charge. And then uh, the uh, Title 26 USC 5861, that would be the unlawful receiving possession manufacturer of a Molotov cocktail. So uh, the, believe it or not, you have to have a Molotov cocktail registered with the United States. Um, if you do not, you would be open to uh, uh, a, a charge of up to 10 years. So we did see quite a few Molotovs that were being utilized throughout the country during the civil unrest and riot fires. And then there is a uh, Title 18 USC 924C, which would be using a Molotov to commit a federal crime of violence or drug dealing, um, which is a mandatory minimum of 30 years uh, if convicted. Um, that would be uh, somebody throwing a Molotov cocktail uh, at a police cruiser um, potentially would be uh, subjected to a 920. Having problems with my, excuse me. The, um, all right, so I spoke to you about uh, why ATF is there. We have our jurisdiction um, over uh, the federal arson crimes. During 2020, I know uh, we said it was a very busy uh, year. Um, we had the arson, or the uh, riots in uh, uh, St. Paul, in Minneapolis, Chicago, Philadelphia, uh, Kenosha. Um, so ATF offices around the country were, were highly involved with going out and conducting the investigations and enforcing the uh, federal arson statutes. Um, you can see some approximate numbers uh, that um, uh, ATF had. There were approximately 416 investigations open with 190 or 109 um, defendants that were recommended for prosecution. And just understand these cases are ongoing. We still have uh, um, defendants that are being uh, developed um, from the uh, Twin Cities, Kenosha, Chicago. So uh, a lot of these uh, um, defendants may not have been recommended for prosecution yet as the investigations continue to uh, play on. One of the, um, so I'm the team leader of, uh, with the ATF National Response Team. If you're not familiar with our National Response Team, it is a, um, a team that is designed to uh, assist our ATF field offices and our state and local partners um, conduct uh, large uh, fire and explosion scenes. Essentially, um, we are a, a force multiplier um, we're able to respond within a 24-hour period um, and take these large scenes 
um, and employ a team concept where we uh, meld with our state and local counterparts and uh, are able to conduct these uh, large investigations and bring them down to a manageable level um, for the field offices to, to uh, continue their investigations once we um, depart the scene. Um, included in that 120 uh, members is uh, uh, certified fire investigators. Um, we have certified uh, explosive specialists, uh, special agent bomb technicians, uh, intel research specialists, our digital investigators, um, which played a uh, critical role uh, in the um, riot fires, uh, forensic chemists, our fire protection engineers, electrical engineers, and our canine partners um, come in that are able to detect ignitable liquids for us. So um, with uh, the riots that occurred uh, throughout um, the recent years, 2015, 2016, 2020, um, the NRT was deployed uh, on five occasions. Um, first back in 2015 uh, with um, the death of Freddie Gray while in police custody. There, there were seven commercial fire scenes that the uh, National Response Team investigated. Um, I know there were multiple vehicles uh, throughout the city that were burned, but uh, the team really focused on seven, these seven commercial fires. Um, again, in 2016, I was actually uh, involved with that call out. Um, and we had, it was uh, involving the, um, the death of uh, Seville Smith. He was shot while being, trying to be taken into custody. It was a police involved shooting. And there were seven commercial fires that we investigated. Uh, at that time. And then um, the 2020 Twin City riots, uh, you can see it was an enormous amount of, uh, of, v of um, structures that were involved. We had 158 commercial structure fires that were investigated. And with that, that's between St. Paul and Minneapolis, um, there were over a total of 560 leads conducted. And uh, I'll talk to you about what our leads are. It's essentially um, investigative actions uh, that occur um, during the call-outs. During 2020 as well, um, uh, with George Floyd uh, riots, there was also uh, civil unrest in Chicago with 53 commercial structure fires um, and government-owned vehicles that were investigated with over 200 leads uh, conducted during those investigations. And then our last call-out would have been in Kenosha, uh, with Jacob Blake. Um, he was shot, if you recall, while police were attempting to take him into custody. Um, and there we had 35 commercial structure fires um, with over 190 leads conducted. So um, that is historically uh, our NRT's involvement with the um, uh, civil unrest fires. The uh, So these call outs and these um, um, incidents are kind of, uh, well, they're very different from our typical um, one large scene type responses that we go out to um, where we're dealing with, you know, one large structure uh, that may have been subjected to an explosion or fire. Here we are dealing with uh, numerous um, uh, fires that are occurring throughout these cities. So, uh, you know, some of the challenges uh, that we're confronted with um, are really trying to adapt to uh, all of these scenes. Obviously, when you have uh, multiple scenes, sometimes in the hundreds, we have to bring in additional resources. So in Minneapolis, for example, we brought roughly 50 NRT members um, in for the uh, call out uh, in that instance to, to uh, team up with our state and local um, uh, partners, as well as the St. Paul Field Division, ATF Field Division. There's obviously the uh, heightened security issues um, for our personnel when they're working out on the scenes because of the uh, rioting activities that are occurring. So with that, we need increased manpower to be able to provide security for our teams while they're on scene. So um, things we need to consider uh, when we're responding to these events. And then the obvious uh, delays in scene response because of the ongoing rioting, um, um, the delays in, in uh, getting to the scenes and then being able to go out to the scenes and investigate them because of the circumstances that are occurring uh, with the ongoing rioting. I know in uh, St. Paul, 
it was several days uh, in Minneapolis till we were able to actually get out to the scenes, get established, and start conducting our investigations. Additional challenges of riot responses, uh, the volume of evidence uh, was enormous. Um, these uh, circumstances and incidents uh, being uh, you know, around the country, not only in the Twin Cities and Chicago, uh, but you have instances happening uh, throughout the country um, and there is an enormous um, volume of evidence that's being collected. So uh, just for example, the third precinct in Minneapolis, we collected over 180, 180 items of evidence that were collected. So uh, ATF has three labs located throughout the country. Uh, so what we had to do was basically categorize our evidence, uh, which evidence went to, to our, our Washington lab, which evidence went to our Atlanta lab, um, and we really had to prioritize uh, what items were sent. Um, and oftentimes that was based on solvability factors of each investigations where we had uh, potentially uh, known um, suspects, identified individuals. Uh, we wanted to send that evidence first so we can move quickly on those cases. Uh, the need for additional personnel, I kind of touched on that. I'm going to touch on the, the difference um, you know, the additional personnel that we need um, compared to our normal call outs, uh, we found that we really had to uh, beef up our um, lead side of the house by adding additional roles um, of, of uh, uh, investigative roles um, to meet the needs of the actual incidents that were out there. Um, the investigations are video driven. So when you think about the uh, uh, all of the chaos, the fires that are occurring, these are really video-driven investigations where we're able to identify our suspects um, through video. Um, you know, when you have a structure that may have 50 looters in there and then a fire occurs, uh, we really need to have some uh, pinpoint good video surrounds to be able to identify which of those looters uh, was responsible for the fire itself. Um, so what does that mean? This is countless hours of video review, hours and hours and hours of uh, our agents and our state and local partners reviewing video uh, to try and identify the suspects that are involved. Um, I can tell you that this video analysis is ongoing and we still have video being analyzed um, from the actual Twin City riot. So we're a year later almost and still going through video evidence. What can the public do to assist? And, and some things that we found uh, with our responses to these types of incidents was, um, you know, some owners would actually, they, they would not even call in a fire that occurred in their building because it may have been a very small fire, self-extinguished, or potentially the uh, suppression system might have, uh, in the building may have put the fire out and the individuals didn't think it was very important to report that the fire occurred. So our canvas teams would be out doing the investigations and, and uh, they'd be looking at a scene and they would have a owner come over and say, hey, by the way, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we had a fire in our business, it was very small, and we actually cleaned it up. Um, so it's, it, we really need the public to report any fire that occurs, even small, because if you recall looking at our statutes, uh, it's, it may just be the attempted um, arson of a structure that affects interstate commerce. So the individual is subject to the same charge, whether it's a small fire or a large fire that occurs. Avoid scene cleanup. This is a uh, image that was in the uh, newspaper um, out in Kenosha. And, and these were um, a community group that um, was trying to help clean up their community. Uh, they organized a cleanup day and they were going around and cleaning up the businesses. Um, the unfortunate part was a lot of this was happening because of the volume of fires before we actually could get to the scenes. So um, we may have had valuable evidence that would have been uh, cleaned up and discarded that could, have, could help us identify individuals. So we, we asked that the business owners Avoid scene cleanup, preserve any potential evidence that may be present, present and uh, so that we can collect it and send it to our labs. 
and securing the scene. What do I mean by that? We don't mean by posting 24 hour security there, but if they can have, you know, the, uh, the, the, the rehab companies um, or themselves go out and board up the scenes uh, to prevent access into the buildings, that would be very helpful for us. How can the public assist uh, with the investigations? Well, again, these are additional factors, um, providing consent. So for us to be able to go in and conduct our investigations, uh, we have to have consent or a search warrant. Um, so business owners, the, the uh, uh, you know, being cooperative with us and providing us consent to search the business for evidence of, of uh, incendiary or arson fires um, is very helpful to us. Uh, provide investigators with any video evidence. If there's a DVR in the building uh, that was preserved um, and there's uh, uh, video evidence on it, we need to, to, to uh, have access to that so we can view it for development of any suspects. Um, some of the videos being stored in cloud in the cloud, I'm just, so any video that was taken, it's, it's critical that uh, the owner occupants provide the investigators with that video for analysis. And then some other things we, we like that can help us put these investigations together, fire burglar alarm data, if the uh, property was protected by a uh, fire alarm system, um, if we can get the, the, uh, the printouts of activities that occurred um, on those systems are very useful for us developing timelines and uh, putting our investigations together. Pre-fire photographs, um, you know, what did the, the structure look like prior to the fire occurring can be helpful for us, can help us identify potentially what contents were in the building, what fuels were there uh, to be set on fire, et cetera. Uh, and then, um, one of the elements, again, for our statutes is uh, being able to substantiate that the business uh, or property affected interstate commerce in some way. And, and if the uh, owners can provide us with uh, invoices, bills, of sale, receipts, anything like that, that can help us identify that, yes, there is some sort of interstate nexus or commerce that's occurring uh, that makes this a federal crime that's very useful to us. Okay. Um, so when the national response team, uh, does respond, we break, uh, our team up into to basically two sides. We have our scene side and then we'll call it the investigative side or our lead side. Um, what do we do uh, with our scene teams? Who do we, uh, put on the scenes? Um, a lot of that is dictated, uh, by the complexity of the scenes, what, what, individuals are available to respond, but these are the common roles that we like to have, uh, would be a team leader, um, a photographer, our evidence tech um, to uh, collect and uh, uh, maintain the evidence, um, a diagrammer or somebody that can scan the units. We have digital scanners that we drop in to the uh, scenes, and then we have an accelerate detection canine team assigned to each group and a medic. Um, usually I know out in, uh, when, when we were out in the Twin Cities, uh, we had four of these teams operating at the same time, um, as opposed to Kenosha, for example, we had two teams operating, um, on scene. Uh, so we're trying to really punch out as many scenes that we can, uh, each and every day. So we split up the groups, um, you know, some of the larger scenes, we may need additional personnel and resources. As, as uh, opposed to some of our smaller scenes, um, we may only need two, three uh, uh, investigators to respond to that scene. Again, I talked to you uh, earlier about the heightened, uh, you know, security issues that we have because of the ongoing violence. So this is just another uh, piece of the puzzle when we respond to these scenes. Uh, so our investigator side can focus on documenting and collecting the evidence and determining the origin and cause of the fire. We need to have perimeter security for each scene. Uh, so we use different resources. Um, oftentimes our state and local partners will uh, give us um, patrol units uh, at the perimeter or we have to, uh, uh, you know, uh, rely on some of our other federal partners, uh, U.S. Marshals, 
um, uh, provided some scene security for us out in the Twin Cities, as you can see in this uh, photo here. Um, other things that we try to do is, uh, you know, conduct the scenes at, at good times. Uh, we don't want to be doing it in the evenings when it's dark. We want to do it during daylight hours and uh, when there's lulls in protesting or rioting activities. So uh, we usually try to, uh, what well, we always do, um, tap into our local resources, uh, our intel, um, and determine, hey, is there going to be any type of protest activity uh, occurring where um, we have scenes today? Can we work scenes away from the uh, uh, activity or potential threats? So we're constantly doing that daily liaison and real-time monitoring of any activities, uh, protesting or rioting that may be occurring uh, where our scene teams are operating. Some of the uh, objectives of our scene teams is obviously the, one of the main priorities is get in there and collect the evidence, our video evidence, our physical evidence, um, things like that, that can help us identify suspects. They will be uh, responsible for documenting the scenes, again, uh, photographs, sketches, and scans, so we can take that information into the courtroom uh, when our origin and cause or certified fire investigators have to testify as to the how and where the fire started. Um, and then the, the uh, origin and cause determination, obviously, where did the fire originate? Uh, do we have multiple fire origin areas within one structure? And then what was the cause? Uh, was it an incendiary device that was used? Um, flares, uh, we see a lot of fireworks are being used um, to cause these fires. We've had flares, the Molotov cocktails, and then the obvious, uh, um, ignitable liquids and then open flames to common combustibles um, is what we're seeing. Fatalities and injuries, uh, each scene, um, our team, our, our teams are looking for any potential uh, victims. Um, in Minneapolis, there was a uh, victim, he was a looter that was trapped in a basement of a, um, I think it was a pawn shop or, or a liquor store uh, that was unable to escape. Um, so that's a, another aspect of the um, uh, um, investigations. And, and when fatalities and injuries do occur, there are, uh, with our federal statutes, there's actually sentencing enhancements that, that come in line with those that can up those mandatory sentences. Um, just on average, from our uh, experience with uh, uh, conducting these investigations, our scene teams would average roughly four uh, scenes per day. Um, so when you're dealing with 158 scenes, uh, you know, do the math on that. We're trying to punch as many scenes out as we can quickly, efficiently, um, so that we can, uh, uh, you know, move on with the investigations. Um, investigator positions. Uh, I spoke to you earlier about, you know, our need or our differences between our standard one large building that was subject to uh, um, a fire scene or explosion, as opposed to here. Um, this is a, a, a massive operation where you're taking in tons and tons of information and data that needs to be analyzed. It needs to be uh, leads assigned and it needs to be organized, cataloged. Um, so we typically, uh, on our national response team, have a leads coordinator. Um, and that is the individual that is basically the air traffic control uh, running the scene for us. Um, what we found is uh, with the over amount, uh, overwhelming amount of uh, information, we also had to add a video coordinator that's an individual responsible for specifically just collecting um, and directing video collection uh, and analysis or social media coordinator. I'm going to go through each one of these uh, in some uh, uh, slides ahead of what their positions really are. Um, but social media is a huge uh, aspect of these investigations. There's tons and tons of evidence being uh, placed on the uh, internet um, that can help us identify suspects. Um, and then the uh, digital investigators, uh, again, we're encountering systems in these scenes. So we need uh, investigators that uh, uh, specialize in recovering, collecting, and preserving uh, digital evidence for us. The case agents are a critical role. They are the, the, the agents that once a uh, suspect's really developed on a specific building, 
they're the uh, investigators that run with the case and put everything together, perfect the case so it can be uh, taken into the courtroom. And then uh, having our state and local uh, uh, individuals, um, our partners integrated into that uh, system is critical. And uh, what we've found is in Twin Cities, Kenosha, Chicago, we always have a, a main primary liaison that we're working with. So you can ensure that you don't have two agencies doing the same thing and that there's redundancy. Um, everything has to be coordinated and, and, and done jointly. Okay. Um, just to kind of break a little bit further into these uh, uh, very important roles in successfully investigating these scenes, uh, again, our leads coordinator, that individual is responsible for coordinating all the interview leads, and we could have hundreds of interviews that need to be conducted. So um, that individual will uh, collect the information of what leads need to be uh, assigned out and assign them to specific agents. We use an automated lead system, so uh, it's our, called our iLead system, which has been very useful, um, especially in these types of uh, circumstances, as, as opposed to our old paper uh, system. So uh, individuals, our agents are receiving uh, lead assignments uh, directly through their phones. And uh, we're also integrating a lot of like geospatial um, type data into these lead systems and our leads generation as well. And then that individual also will oversee and direct the collection of all investigative documents, our consents uh, to be able to access the, the buildings, um, records, subpoenas uh, that we need for potentially any, uh, you know, um, uh, collection of documents, etc. And then once we uh, start identifying um, subjects, uh, maybe releasing images out to the media, um, the leads coordinator is responsible for taking any tips that we receive in and assigning those tips or leads out to the agents to follow up on. And then they also are responsible for coordinating all the fire scene actions. So you have 158 fire scenes tracking which uh, scenes exist, which scenes need assigned, uh, which scenes have been completed, um, so we do not miss anything. The video coordinator, uh, critical role. Um, video, like I said, these uh, investigations are video driven, so the uh, video coordinator is essentially uh, responsible for the coordination, collection, and analysis of surveillance cameras uh, throughout the city. Surveillance cameras, meaning inside of the affected businesses, surrounding properties, uh, city closed circuit uh, uh, cameras, traffic cameras, and witness video on phones, um, ring doorbells, etc. Uh, so that individual, the the leads coordinator, is is going to send out canvas teams where they will go out and identify where these cameras are, um, contacts uh, to uh, uh, collect the video footage. And then also having that video assigned to agents for analysis and reporting. Um, identifying protest uh, route and riot routes. So uh, one of the things the uh, video coordinator will be responsible for is coordinating with that state or local liaison to identify uh, routes that were taken or known routes of where rioting and protest occurred um, during the incident so that we can focus our, our, our canvas teams in those areas uh, for the, the uh, collection of those cameras and the uh, you know, dates and times um, of when the uh, protests occur so that we can kind of narrow down what video needs to be collected. Our digital evidence uh, recovery, I spoke to you briefly about those. Um, you know, some of these systems are complicated for uh, field agents. Uh, we have to have uh, our special investigators come in and extract DVR units, preserve hard drives, maybe clean hard drives, um, and try and recover a lot of the data from those hard drives. Um, DIs have processed, uh, just for example, during the Twin Cities, um, 43 DVRs, 11 phones, and one iPad, an HP tablet, and a rack server. You know that rack server was uh, uh, from the U.S. Post Office, and uh, our our digital investigators spent, um, I think, maybe a day or two just cleaning the rack system so that they could go in and extract uh, the video surveillance from that unit. 
And then a very, uh, one of the final really important roles is social media coordinator. Um, as you know, uh, folks are posting videos online everywhere. Um, a lot of the uh, suspects that were developed from the third precinct were from uh, social postings on YouTube, Facebook, TikTok, Twitter, um, all of these platforms. Um, all things social media is really what they are focused on. Uh, they coordinate with our ATF Internet Investigation Center, or IIC, so that's in uh, Washington, D.C., at our headquarters. Those folks, when we have, uh, uh, you know, foreseeable civil unrest, um, riots in, in certain areas, they start monitoring and collecting the social uh, media, um, and we work with those folks to identify suspects. And then uh, they will assign the uh, social media leads, uh, the video collection, the review and recording, um, which can get very complicated. You don't want to have redundancy. You don't want to have two agents working on the same thing. So everything has to be very coordinated uh, so we can work efficiently and, uh, um, um, and timely. Uh, and then uh, they will also help identify bloggers who operate in the area. What we find is you go around the country, different areas where these events are occurring, there's different bloggers uh, who are posting information out there. And this is something that's ongoing because uh, you will find that these bloggers will post videos several weeks after the incident that can be very usable uh, uh, information for developing suspects. And then they will also work with the analysts to identify the uh, account holders and retrieve original format because you, you lose some clarity on the uh, posting. So we try to uh, get our hands on the actual um, uh, original format. So that really ends uh, everything I had to speak uh, to you about, um, the importance of these investigations. Um, if you have questions for me, please don't hesitate to give me a call or shoot me an email. Um, just understand that, um, you know, if you have some foreseeable civil unrest in your area, there's an incident that occurs, uh, that ATF is a resource that you can uh, rely upon um, and ask for our assistance and we will uh, be there to assist you. So, again, thank you and enjoy the rest of the presentation. Uh, over the area of how ATF is involved with these uh, tragic events and uh, the details that go along with that. Um, I, I am uh, I have to make an apology here. I reread some of my information and I missed a very important partner, and that's the National Fire Protection Association. They are a great partner in Arson Awareness Week each year. And and uh, upon rereading, I noticed that I missed that entire line. Um, so with that, our next presenter is nothing short of amazing. I first met him as the fire chief for the nation's largest combined career and volunteer fire department located in Prince George's County, Maryland. Mark Bayshore is in his 40th year of service, having worked in emergency service leadership positions in Maryland, West Virginia, and Florida, currently serving as the public safety director for Highlands County, Florida, Chief Bayshore has presented at most of the major conferences across the United States, and has lectured on behalf of the NFPA in Beijing, China, and Sao Paulo, Brazil. He also currently serves as the executive editor for FireRescue1.com, the leading industry.com news information and trading provider. Thank you for joining us today, Mark. Thanks, Bruce. I appreciate it. And uh, since most people aren't going to want to look at me, I am going to share the screen. A lot of what we do, obviously, is... Uh, in the fire service, ultimately we see the public debacle that a lot of other folks see of all of these different uh, civil disturbance issues. And uh, when I'm talking to fire people, I talk about the decisions that they have to live with and certainly decisions they can't live without. Um, as you know, we are an acronym laden uh, industry. I included for my law enforcement friends, uh, I know you all proposed that the fire service changed their acronym to EET which uh, is evidence eradication team, but uh, that is not what we're gonna change to. And it certainly is not what we uh, intend to do, but we recognize that sometimes when we get ourselves in there and uh, you, you, you heard what uh, the, talked about the evidence they tried to collect, that sometimes we booger that all up with our uh, fire hose and uh, we try not to. And, and certainly during civil disturbance, we need to be 
extremely cognizant of that. Let's go ahead and uh, got a couple of videos in here. Let's let them play. Maybe. So I ask people who's paying attention, who's really paying attention. many times do we focus on what's going on right in front of us that we lose sight of what's coming to get us? And as we talk to the fire departments and frankly our law enforcement uh, partners, I always ask them who's leading the charge, who's leading the challenge, and who's leading the change in their organizations. Uh, because ultimately, you know, we have a mission and we know about the everyday. Let's take a look at a couple of the everyday. We know how to handle these. The video is heart-stopping. A mother desperately handing her children to firefighters as they escape flames from their burning apartment. One by one, the children are lifted over a railing to firefighters who have formed an assembly line to get them to... Safety. Is there anybody else over there? Only after the kids were rescued did the mom climb over the railing to save herself. And not a moment too soon. So what you see there is what firefighters are dealing with every day all over the country. We've got that, right? How does civil unrest change that? We have new pictures and video of a man accused of attacking a local firefighter in Rochester and damaging a fire truck over the weekend. RPD tweeted out video and pictures of the suspect. Police say Saturday the man assaulted the firefighter while the crew here was responding to the scene of a fire. In the video, the fire truck is on Court Street near Dinosaur Barbecue, maybe heading to the PSB mm -hmm. where the cars were burning. The firefighters union sent out an update Sunday saying the wounded firefighter had minor injuries. If you don't know anything about the man seen in the video, there's also other images we'll put on WHEC.com. Are you ready for that? Are our law enforcement agencies ready to support that? I mean, ultimately, these are the things that we've got to deal with when we're talking about civil disturbance as opposed to that every day. Got to make sure that we have the process and procedure. We're going to talk about some of those, talk about what the priorities are, talk about making a decision, and talk about acting. Because uh, ultimately, we don't have uh, time to uh, sit back and rethink some of these things. And we'll talk about when you have to have that uh, mindset of go or no go here in just a minute. The OODA loop, uh, another acronym for those that don't have it, observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, it's uh, Air Force Colonel John Boyd came up with this back in the uh, Korean War uh, to train uh, fighter pilots. But ultimately we're training firefighters this way today in the observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, to move and get moving and get the fire out or get moving and get the situation taken care of. Sometimes the OODA loop uh, is a little fast for the civil disturbance issues that we're dealing with. And sometimes we have to pull ourselves back. Uh, and again, we'll talk a little bit about that. For those that have been around for a long time, you know the planning P, the planning P in emergency management and a lot of uh, the training that goes on with EMI uh, is really what the OODA loop is. It's just the OODA loop is the street. Uh, the planning P is uh, the book, uh, the OODA loop is the street. And there's the observe, orient, decide, and act. It really is decision making 101. Uh, we don't need people second guessing themselves. We don't need people uh, who can't make the decision out there on the street. We want them to make a decision and act. And I talked about that and you know, his concept was that the agility uh, can beat raw power every time and that survival in war is the difference between winners and losers. And that's his whole basis behind uh, the OODA loop to keep moving. As mayor and leading demonstrations, we had a police force and we had a student government uh, related to the various colleges and we had discipline organized marches. 
This is really deliberate chaos. Sixth Street and, uh, now watch this. Watch this gentleman in the uh, sweatshirt you see there. He'll come back into the screen in just a minute. The restraint that the firefighters used in this particular uh, incident is amazing. I'm not sure why they had to be at this particular scene, but they were, and they were doing what they had to do. Are, because it's stretched so thin already, cannot get into every situation where firefighters need to put out a fire. And this is what we thought the guard would do, the National Guard, that they would protect Here he goes. some of these firefighters oh. going in. It's what we saw in 1990. And hopefully he's getting chased down by that crowd back. because he just pulled on their hose line. But um, those are the types of things that our firefighters are going to have to deal with and be prepared during civil disturbance. So we talk about operational readiness on the fire side, fire and EMS. We need to make sure that uh, they have policy, that they have mutual aid agreements, and understand that mutual aid agreements are really one of the linchpins. Policy is and mutual aid agreements, and of course, legal and risk review as well. Um, but having formal mutual aid agreements that are uh, codified in advance, not something that you do on the fly. I don't need the ATF agent or FBI agent that's uh, in charge showing up on the scene to be the first time I've ever met them. I don't need my neighboring fire chief to show up on a scene being the first time I've met them. All of those things need to be coordinated in advance and make sure that not only that you have written mutual aid agreements that are uh, recorded, but that it's practiced. Because ultimately the agreement's only as good as the paper it's written on if you're not doing something about it every day. So you need to make sure that you practice those mutual aid agreements that on the fire side, legal and risk management review is something we go through just like law enforcement every day. Uh, and recognizing, and you're going to see this twice, that everything we do is uh, going to be microanalyzed. Uh, and ultimately, everybody needs to understand, you know, we're constantly making life and death decisions regardless of that microanalyzed uh, attitude. Training and ed education is obviously important. I talked about it with the mutual aid agreement. You need to make sure you practice the mutual aid agreements. You need to train on all of these things. You need to have the right procedures and orders that uh, we'll talk about some of the best practices in just a minute. Uh, but also fire departments need to recognize your limitations. I, I joked about the uh, evidence eradication team in the beginning, um, but ultimately fire departments need to recognize their limitations and their authorities. When you come to a civil disturbance, a fire chief who's used to, who is used to being in charge should not be the one that's in charge. At a minimum, they should be part of a unified command post that is stood up. Uh, but if law enforcement has set up a command post and is not going to have a unified command post for some reason, uh, then the fire chief needs to default to their uh, position to be able to command their troops uh, and fit into what will hopefully become a unified command post. But recognize the limitations and authorities is huge when it comes to the fire department and repeating everything we do is being microanalyzed. Regardless of being microanalyzed, it's still making life and death decisions. So some of the best practices, the International Association of Fire Chiefs put out uh, some really good best practice material. We're gonna look at a couple of things that were developed by fire departments here in a second. We need to make sure that the agency, and this, is, this to me goes for everybody, not just for fire and EMS, law enforcement as well. And I think sometimes we lose sight of, uh, we all, we all lose sight of who's, uh, you know, that whole Superman complex that takes over us. We need to make sure that our agencies have a plan for our people, for our facilities, for our apparatus and equipment, and then for our community. It, it can't just be about, okay, we're gonna to respond to that fire and put it out. There has to be more to it when we're talking about civil disturbance. Some of the, uh, the other things, and you heard Bruce mention NFPA as a partner, NFPA 3000 is the ballistic protection that came about after uh, Pulse and a couple others um, occurred that uh, uh, we in the fire service have used NFP 3000 to get ballistic protection on a, on a tremendous number of units that didn't used to have them. Uh, NFPA 1500 talks about fire and EMS personnel and how they should be used and specifically says they should not be used for crowd control. I know there are lots of folks who say, I would have turned that hose on that crowd. I would have just opened up, uh, for those not in the fire service, I would have opened up that wagon pipe, the master stream that's on the fire truck and just blasted those people. Add your honor to the end of that is what I tell a fire chief that uh, that says that. Uh, ultimately, fire and EMS personnel should not find themselves on the end of being crowd control uh, unless it is a last resort to protect yourselves. 
So fire chiefs need to be aware of that and do the best they can. Getting back to operational uh, readiness, identify a phased approach. A suggestion, and I'm actually going to add a fourth one to this, but uh, phase one is planning. Phase two is preparation, which is typically 24 to 48 hours in advance. Um, so in phase two would be things like, all right, we're going to start canceling training. We're going to start canceling station visits. We're going to start canceling things that are not emergent or not critical to the operation. Uh, we're not calling people back yet or anything, but we're, we're taking those steps. And then phase three is operations. The phase four that I'll suggest you need to add uh, is a demobilization and a return to normal. Uh, a lot of times we'll get to phase three and go, okay, it's over, done with, and you know everybody uh, swipes their hands and we're done, but there really has to be a phase four, a demobilization and a return to normalcy. Uh, and then having an operational approach that embraces hot, warm, and cold zones. If you know hazardous materials, you know hot, warm, and cold zones. If you know firehouse design of the 21st century, you know hot, warm, and cold zones. We need to do the same thing with respect to civil disturbance uh, responses. Um, I, I get a lot of grief from my law enforcement partners when I talk about uh, uh, incident worksheets or command worksheets. And uh, they actually, a lot of them kind of joke at it. Um, at the end of the day, you know, we do a lot of these things every day, but by the time you get, you heard the ATF, uh, um, you, you heard uh, Seth talking about the 50 agents they had to have. At some point that needs to be recorded on whether it's a piece of paper or whether it's an electronic uh, format needs to be recorded who's there, who's in charge, who's got the different divisions, the different groups, uh, whatever it is that they're going to be called. And my suggestion to you is that most of our command charts that we use every day are not civil unrest friendly. They are typical fire friendly, maybe mass casualty friendly, but for long duration, um, uh, long events like that, they're not typically civil unrest friendly. So think about that and think about whether you need to have one of those civil unrest friendly charts. Have some checklists that uh, memory joggers to avoid the crisis mush. And what I mean about the crisis mush is that, you know, the things we do every day, yeah, we rattle them off. Okay, the first attack line is going to the fire, the second line to the exposure, the third, you know, search, all of those different things that are happening. We got that all day long. We still need to record those things. But when it comes to this civil unrest in the crisis type of incidents that happen, you don't deal with those every day. And unless you have some of these memory joggers and some of these, um, the, the different charts that will capture those things, you have a, a much higher uh, likelihood that you're going to either forget something critical or that uh, get something out of order in the way it should be done or you want it to be done. Have those memory joggers and make sure that people are using them on your scenes. Have a go or no go approach. Uh, you know, if, if you think about uh, and again, those in the fire service know Battalion Chief McNamee uh, from Worcester. Um, they lost six firefighters in that cold storage warehouse. And Battalion Chief McNamee finally stood in the doorway and presented himself like an X in the doorway and said no more. Uh, while people were, make, were, were trying to get past him, other firefighters were trying to get past him uh, to go in and save their brothers that were already lost. He made the go, no go decision. And that's what fire chiefs have to be prepared to do when it comes to civil disturbances. Uh, have that go, no go approach, uh, at least in their mind, have the slow down and back up as options in their mind. Uh, talk about initial entry, talk about crowd control, how that's gonna be done. What is the personal protection? Do you have ballistic protection for your firefighters and paramedics? What infrastructure protection are you gonna be uh, part of? The water supply systems, uh, the sewer systems, the fire stations, the police stations, are you gonna be part of that? and rescue task forces. How many of our law enforcement members uh, are part of a rescue task force with their local fire department? You heard the, uh, Seth talk about having a medic on his entry team. How about firefighters? Do they have firefighters who are there uh, to be part of that team just in case they need something? Don't necessarily have to be on every rescue task force, but it is an interdisciplinary team to be able to go get the things done that need to be done. And then still thinking about that, that go, no go, back up or slow down. You know, safety, of course, is overall for all of us, but we also we're in a civil disturbance situation. So we're in an inherently dangerous position already. Uh, we're not going to be able to be completely safe because of the environment that's around us. Got to determine when it's time to retreat. I hate that word, but at some point we got to determine when it's time. Remember, it's a crime scene. They're law enforcement folks. I said it. It's a crime scene. So our firefighters and fire chiefs need to be cognizant of 
their uh, uh, evidence eradication team, um, uh, the, the aura of that. And uh, ultimately, the greater good, you know, we talk about the First Amendment and uh, things, uh, our, our firefighters and fire chiefs could really care less about all of those things when it comes to putting the fire out and saving Grandma Jones. Uh, they, that's what they're trained to do. And at some point, uh, they, they're going to have to have a reality check when it comes to civil disturbance and civil unrest, because they're normal, the way they're normally wired isn't the way they're going to be able to be wired during the civil disturbance uh, events. In review, you know, we talked about the mission and we talked about how civil disturbance changes the challenge. Uh, ultimately, we know that everyday fire, but the civil disturbance really does change our challenge. We talked about the OODA loop, observe, orient, decide, and act, and how that is uh, part of what we try to do to get people in that thought process of, of you know, in and out, in and out done. Um, and then making sure that we have uh, safety for our people, our facilities, our equipment, and our communities. Having that go, no go, and slow down and back up approach, policy, procedure, and best practices using the IAFC and NFPA. Uh, as uh, best practices, lots of different, uh, lots of different uh, good uh, material out there, and then the mutual aid agreements. Huge piece on mutual aid agreements to make sure that we're not meeting each other for the first time while our neighborhood's burning down. We need to make sure that we've met each other before, that we have the agreements in place already. It's past your legal and our legal, uh, because heaven knows that our legal is different from everybody else's uh, jurisdiction's legal, and I still don't figure that part out. But it is what it is. They've got to do their thing. Have a phased approach to response, uh, to preparedness and response, and make sure that uh, we're always looking at the greater good because we never know what's coming to get us. Are you ready? I appreciate it. Uh, there's my contact information and um, be happy to answer questions later on and I will turn it back over to Bruce. An excellent presentation as I expected. When I uh, asked Mark to join us on this uh, presentation and uh, for Arson Awareness Week, I knew I picked the right guy. Um, so thank you very much, Mark, very appreciative. Um, our next presenter, he's our third presenter of the group and it's, it's, uh, it's very near and dear to my heart. John Tippett is the Director of Fire Service Programs for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. He joined the NFFF in 2018. John's fire service career started in Montgomery County, Maryland, where he spent 35 years retiring as a two, in 2009 as a safety battalion chief. He then moved to the Charleston, South Carolina Fire Department as the CFD's first deputy chief of operations and spent one year as an interim fire chief. His work in Charleston involved assisting with the Charleston Fire Department's recovery from the tragic Sofa Superstore fire. That took the lives of nine firefighters in 2007. John continues to be an active firefighter with the North Beach Volunteer Fire Department in Carroll, Calvert County, Maryland. He holds a bachelor's degree in fire science and a master's degree in emergency services management. John has worked extensively on officer development and fire safety initiatives, including introducing crew resource management to the fire service and firefighter near miss reporting system. John was the 2006 recipient of the ISFSI's George D. Post Instructor of the Year Award. Take it away, John. Thank you very much, Bruce. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. I'm going to uh, work on a share screen option for us to take a look here. Here we go.
So um, we're going to do a nice follow up to uh, Chief Bayshore's uh, presentation. And as always, uh, that's always a very tough act to follow. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the response during civil unrest. And some of this is based on some very, very minor interactions that I've had during periods of, of, of unrest uh, temporarily um, during the course of my career. Um, actually, uh, Seth set the stage and uh, Chief Bayshore followed up with the 2020 being the highest level of civil unrest in the United States since the 1960s. So that creates a pretty dynamic uh, situation because we're about two generations removed now from people that had garnered a, a huge amount of experience and uh, left their legacies um, in, in a variety of different ways, but some of those missions get lost, as, as we all know. Uh, Fire and EMS, as, as Chief Bayshore mentioned, and also Seth talked about, were very integral as, as part of that response to the unrest. Uh, the question was, were the fire departments prepared? Uh, what had they done in advance? Uh, certainly, these situations become out of the norm. Uh, everything that we thought we knew about our community and the people that we serve and the people that we care about uh, seems to take a different tack when uh, the civil unrest occurs. Um, those lessons from two generations ago may have been lost in history, and um, we may not have been thinking about them, as, as Chief uh, Bayshore mentioned in his. So one of the things that we have picked up here is that situations um, the old lessons that were reinforced and new lessons were learned as we were going on. And uh, this will be kind of a follow-up presentation to what Chief Bayshore did. So um, we had just a brief exposure there to our, our engine company that was responding to an event. Um, they were sort of uh, um, taken by surprise by the actions of the, of the rioters there and then become engrossed in the actual attack. Uh, fortunately, none of them were seriously injured, but nonetheless, it, it certainly changes your perspective about um, you know, serving that community that's out there. So, um, Capitalizing on a few points that Chief Bayshore was talking about, the crew preparation element is critical. Um, many of these events some, sometimes will emerge organically and fire departments and fire companies aren't really prepared for the event that happens, but it's really critical that uh, crews are paying attention in advance of what's going on and make sure that they have, um, they've taken the right steps to get themselves ready for that type of response. Um, Apparatus hardening is critical whenever the opportunity avails itself. As you can see from some of the from photos there, glass is the weakness in the apparatus. Um, it, it does allow for projectiles to go through rather easily, uh, even though it's, it's safety glass. But um, as, uh, as we learned from the events of the 1960s, that was really the transition of apparatus moving from open cab to closed cab. And you see in the lower right there, some of the work that the FDNY had done with their apparatus was create um, uh, makeshift coverings until uh, new equipment could be purchased and, and um, have its um, protection permanent. But nonetheless, uh, the, the glass, the windows and the trucks are still going to be weak spots. Um, it's, it's not easy to reinforce them uh, and still maintain your ability to have your visibility. Uh, the idea there of, uh, of making sure you're, you're OODA looped, you're oriented to your situation, and you can sort of evolve, you can make sure you're taking care of yourself as the situation is evolving. Um, some steps, some minor steps that can be taken, you can use duct tape to um, cover the windows, make sure it's going okay. Um, response route alterations, uh, try not to go to the normal routes the way you're responding. Uh, that you would normally go to places. And then it's really, really critically important 
that uh, you you maintain as low a profile as, as you possibly can when you're going into these types of events. Lights and sirens uh, should not be used as you're as you're going into these riotous areas. Um, do not enter any of those areas without law enforcement uh, supporting you. As we saw that one engine company in the last presentation, one engine company was fighting at uh, auto fire. Um, and again, the question becomes, why are we there? Well, because that's what we what we do. We're not uh, we're not really wired to not respond to incidents. But <clears throat> the civil unrest event is one that creates a whole new world and requires us to, to have some extra added protection, including that law enforcement to recon the event at, uh, at the outset. And then also provided escort services to to get us to the scene in and out of the scene safely and uh, and back home again. So once you're there, once you're in operations, um, that safety perimeter, establishing a safety perimeter is pretty important. Um, early on in these events, as they're as they're evolving, uh, law enforcement's going to be overwhelmed. So maybe there does become an opportunity there or an option to to uh, delay response until the situation can be secured. Um, it's a rare occasion when a firefighter is killed in one of these events, but they, they, they did happen in the 1960s. Um, dozens of firefighters were injured through the course of events uh, that have occurred um, in the 60s and also what we recently experienced. So uh, it's, it is important to get that, that, that perimeter established. Um, beef up your manpower. Don't go in there with minimum staffing. Somebody has to be posted as a lookout so crews will be able to see things or see things that are emerging or evolving. People get ready to, to uh, engage. Uh, strategy, um, offensive for life safety only. Uh, otherwise, it's defensive strategies. One of the things that was learned from the riots of the 60s where crews would go in, knock fires down to prevent conflagration, and then get out of the area as quickly as possible. So the objectives uh, while you're operating on scene, first of all, it's going to be scene safety for the crew. Um, these are going to be these can be long duration events where there is not a lot of relief uh, at the at the initial outset. Um, you want to make sure there's an operational period that's that's there. Um, you want to make sure your crews are given uh, proper rest. So, as Chief Bayshore mentioned in his presentation, you want to bring people in early. You want to bring people in often. Uh, you want to take full advantage of your mutual aid agreements. Um, make sure they've been exercised and ready to go. Um, when you're actually operating on the scene, um, keep track of the clock. Uh, crews ought to be going in in task forces at least with two engines and a ladder so that there's a little bit of safety in numbers and a chief officer. Uh, great time if your system does not normally do this, but to provide an aid for the chief. So there's another set of eyes on the scene. Um, and of course, we're laying kind of out, laying the groundwork out here for a very uh, um, staffing intensive operation. Um, the, the worst thing you can do for the firefighters and even for the community is to go in there with, with minimally staffed crews. Uh, you'll be quickly overwhelmed and not be able to get resources as, as you need them be spread too thin. Um, as uh, Chief Bashir talked about the OODA loop, um, the observation period is very critical, but orienting, as Boyd talked about, is the most critical element in that whole OODA loop process. So remember from the outset, you're not going to that normal structure fire. You're not going to go into that operation and operate as you normally would operate. You are going to go in and you're going to do what is necessary to put the, bring the fire under control but not necessarily put the fire completely out if the situation uh, becomes uh, untenable and then be able to get out when it's when it's time to go. So the, the when it's time to go element on that operating when you're operating there is going to be part of that orienting process. Keep assessing what's going on. Is your law enforcement protection stable? Is um, you know, if, if you came in with National Guard, uh, do they have your perimeter set up effectively? Um, even if those people are in place for your protection, make sure there's still a fire service um, lookout there to take, pay attention to what's going on as well. Um, crews can become very focused on what they're doing, even if they're in defensive operations. So we want to be careful when we're operating at some of these fires, especially if, they get, if they're well-developed uh, for, the, for the structural collapse 
uh, and God forbid uh, any crew should be injured in, in, in an event like that. So um, when it's time to go, what's your, when your gut tells you it's time to go is one critical thing to think about. Uh, these, are, these are abnormal situations and uh, the normal thought process is not necessarily gonna work here. So pay close attention to what is going on inside your brain. Um, part of what Boyd talked about was agility. And it is critical that you maintain that uh, ability to recognize when it's time to get out, um, engage as quickly as possible, even if that means leaving equipment on the scene, uh, get on the apparatus, protect yourselves, and, and move out. So when you're getting out of there, scene disengagement, we talked about demobilizing. Um, it, it, it does become a matter of uh, people not letting their guards down. You know, once, once the urgency of the emergency has passed, people will have a tendency or a sense to believe that uh, everything is better. And that's not necessarily the case. Um, Seth talked about, you know, what can you do to uh, help the uh, investigation that will come along afterwards um, to the best of your ability, um, preserve, the, preserve the scene. But again, if we're operating at the height of the riot, uh, or the height of the civil disturbance, it's going to be critical that the personnel safety is top is top priority, and you may not be able to do anything to prevent evidence. So, um, if time avails itself, if the aid is available, if there's a capability, um, engage a cell phone, um, take some footage from uh, on scene while you're there, capture those initial arriving moments, and then do a quick with your camera, and then and then get out of there your phone. Keeping track of your people is important. Make sure everybody is uh, staying together and operating uh, uh, to the best of their ability. And then uh, do a really good head count on your way out. Um, make a case here for the apparatus, for the incident check sheet that uh, Chief Bayshore talked about as well. They, um, that incident commander, that tactical worksheet is invaluable. There is, uh, there, you know, even on the, the normal emergencies that we go to, you can suffer from. Um, uh, an overload of, of information coming in. But now when you're faced with uh, an unruly crowd or um, a well-involved fire or people that are trying to interfere with your operations, it, it, it will knock you off your game. So that tactical worksheet will be, uh, will be critical to making sure what you're gonna do. Um, what, what are you gonna do next? What, what happens as you're getting ready to get out of there? Ideally, uh, you'd be taken to a rehab area first, but um, when the situation is uh, in its still emergent stage, you may be going from response to response to response. The key there is making sure your equipment is as ready as can be, and also making sure you have things like water in your tank, uh, fuel in your truck, um, air in your SCBA cylinders. Uh, and if you have to do that on the fly, then, then, then you know, find a logistics place to make that happen, or there should be a logistics place where you can pick up and drop off equipment. But make sure that as long as the situation allows, uh, before you leave the scene, you're, you're ready to go to that next event. Um, the safe and sound element. Once, once you're there, uh, get to that area of refuge that have been established. Um, if you task force, go out as a task force. Uh, very, very critical to get rehab uh, when and where you can. Um, again, ideally, these, these places will be set up outside of the, uh, even outside of the warm zone, you'd be in a cold zone where folks can recover and, re and refresh. Um, pretty critical point here for, for mental health aspect. These events fly in the face of how we do business normally. And they can be um, even more stressful because we are, we are not being treated the way we would normally be treated when we go into a community. So having that, um, mental health professional that's there in rehab to be able to talk to firefighters and uh, EMS providers, uh, give them a chance to maybe blow off a little bit of steam after they've maybe been attacked or been under a rock uh, attack and uh, make sure that they they're, they're, they're uh, have a chance to, to voice their, their frustrations, uh, their anger even, and all those uh, other things that uh, those emotions that boil up when you're, when you're doing something outside the norm. Um, make sure there's an after action conducted while you're in rehab. Talk about what happened on the last run before you go to the next run, if at all possible. Um, your game will get better uh, as, as you've had a chance to 
uh, put into practice what you have uh, done with the last series. And uh, it's also a good way to, to act as some of that decompression, be able to talk through the event that you were there. Uh, the return to duty, uh, alluded to it a little bit in the last uh, scene of, or the last slide when you were getting out of there. But if, if this is a long duration event and you can get a full rotation of personnel in and out, um, there may be some people that are not ready to go back into that and, and um, they should be substituted out so that you can get some uh, firefighters into the, the emergency. Um, you can bring some new people into the game, some people that are uh, not necessarily as highly stressed as the people that were in the, in the initial response. So what's next? Well, um, it certainly does appear that civil unrest is in our society for the foreseeable future. Uh, there does seem to be a trailing off. Uh, protests are still continuing on a fairly regular basis. They seem to have become less uh, violent. Which is, which is a good thing all the way around. But um, as the folks from our generation learned, or the two generations ago from the 1960s, history does repeat itself. So whether it's on your cycle of career or the next cycle of career, uh, the advice that um, Chief Bayshore gave in his presentation is, is just as valid today as it was um, 40 and 50 years ago. Um, fire departments definitely need to be uh, vigilant and tuned into what's happening in their communities. It's um, a fact of the fire service lifestyle and history, except for the volunteer departments, that most members do not live in the communities where they work. So um, it is important for them to pay attention to what's happening in the community. Um, when planning is done for civil unrest, the fire to have a seat at the table uh, to be a, an important component of what's happening there and then uh, be a part of that integrated um, uh, and uh, integrated command post. You want to periodically review those civil unrest plans. If, if, they, if you have not experienced civil unrest in your community, then you're pretty fortunate. This is a great time to go find what's going on with those uh, plans, uh, dust them off, out, see how valid they are for now, update them as necessary, and practice them. Um, uh, tabletop them, uh, put them into play as part of your, your normal uh, training schedule on a periodic basis. Visit and establish those automatic aid agreements. And as Chief Bayshore said, time to find out if they're going to work is not when the event is unfolding. It's well in advance of what's happening. Take every opportunity to um, practice your civil, uh, your, your automatic aid agreements in um, opportunities outside of the civil unrest. And then at least on practice those activation plans. Uh, work with the people in the stations, uh, make sure you're bringing, uh, they bring extra clothing to, to work, uh, maybe bring some extra food on their own to work. Sometimes ramping up those logistical aspects is pretty difficult. And you could be on your own for 24 hours or, or, or so. Uh, borrowing from the USAR world, be prepared for at least three days of, of operations on your own um, so that you can, you can make sure you're, you're ready for to do what you need to do and rely on each other. So that's going to kind of wrap it up, um, uh, shorten things up a little bit, uh, not to uh, follow through or, or just continue to regurgitate what Chief uh, Bayshore talked about, but hope it picked up, uh, you picked up a couple of points um, of uh, reinforcement of, of what his presentation was and uh, also a, a couple of new things to think about when it comes to operating on the scene. If you have any questions, uh, feel free. There's my contact information. And it'll be available for questions later. Outstanding, John. Thank you so much for taking us into that section of it. Uh, it's important to remember that uh, you know we're we're not only responding, but our response also matters to our families that we're supposed to return home to. So thank you very much. And now for our final installment of this informational encyclopedia, I now introduce the closer. He has luckily recorded his presentation as he is not available at the moment, but will hopefully break free for the Q&A segment at the end. His presentation will provide some guidance toward courses offered here at the great National Fire Academy campus. George Morgan has over 45 years of extensive experience within the Fire Services Administration and operations. 
His oversight includes planning, organizing, directing, and coordinating the activities of fire departments to include fire and EMS emergency response, training, and education, special operations to involve hazardous materials, technical rescue, and marine firefighting, logistical support of maintenance and quartermaster, and the fire marshal's office. Chief Morgan graduated from the University of Phoenix earning a master's degree in organizational management and a second master's in adult education. He earned a bachelor's degree from University of Maryland, University College in Fire Service Administration. Now I ask that uh, Tanya, if you could uh, set up his presentation. Thank you. All right, well, if I can get these buttons to work correctly. I, uh, I'm uh, grateful for everyone attending today. Um, and the, uh, I hope this information has been enlightening and uh, gives you a lot of insight on not only the situations at hand, what our future holds, but the courses that you can take at the National Fire Academy to uh, better yourself and, of course, you know, your teammates. Uh, so hopefully, that will all work out very well. So I, we're gonna to go to the Q&A portion. And so I'm going to in, uh, invite up everybody that's here. Um, George has not signed back one, but I don't have any questions for him at least. So I think we're okay. So the, the question with, there's George. Welcome, George. <laughs> That was a great recording, sir. Great, great. So, the question with the most votes, this goes to Chief Bayshore, would it be possible to get copies of those forms that uh, he was referring to? So I, I'll leave that to you, Mark. Yeah, and those particular ones were taken, I uh, know it's no, no secret, but from uh, Prince George's County, Maryland. So what I did while I saw all those votes going on I went ahead and exported it to Excel, took their stuff off of it so that uh, people can personalize it. So however we want to make it available uh, in an Excel format is what I have, so you can personalize it for themselves. Uh, just tell me how you want to do that, Bruce, as far as, uh, I mean, I, they could email me just as well, or I could upload it to you so you could upload it to them. Okay, well, I'll be, uh, because this will also answer another question out there as far as uh, the rec recordation and getting this uh, presentation. Um, this everyone that is on here today, as well as those that have signed up to receive a copy, will get a copy of this entire presentation. Uh, so we'll we can work in those forms as well. So if you get those to okay. me, then I can attach them to those same emails. Yep. Let's see. The next question is: Will there be certificates issued? Um, this is, however, not a uh, certified training. This is informative training. Um, that uh, we do annually. So I do not have certificates for this uh, presentation. Uh, see here, of all recommendations for prosecution, this one goes to Seth, how many were actually prosecuted? Were there any convictions where the mandatory sentence was handed down? Um, uh, I'm sorry. Boy, that's not a loaded question, Seth. <laughs> I know. How about it? In response to that, uh, uh, I don't know an answer to that. I can assure you uh, that um, in uh, at the Twin Cities, um, in Kenosha, Chicago, we actually had the United States Attorney's Office representatives working with us uh, hand in hand. They were assigned to our command post, um, uh, helping us uh, with uh, obtaining warrants and, and, and working on complaints, etc. So. Um, uh, before we left uh, the Twin Cities, I, I'm pretty sure we had uh, 14 arrests made, maybe 16 in that area. We had some fugitives. If you go back to my presentation, there was a, uh, a wanted uh, sign, I, I think, uh, early uh, uh, in the beginning of that. And uh, that was for Jose Filan and his, uh, his wife that actually they were responsible for about four or five fires in St. Paul. Um, Ultimately, they fled to Mexico and have since been apprehended. So um, there, there were several uh, 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 arrests made, and I'm not sure where they are um, in the actual court system. I do know there were quite a few 
uh, pleas that actually have occurred though so far as well. Outstanding. It appears the next question is for you to you as well. It's two, but it's kind of loaded as well. So I'm going to break it down. I'm going to ask the first question, give you a chance, and then I'll ask the second portion. Can you discuss how, if at all, ATF integrates the use of investigative intel analysis into these cases? Um, yes, yeah, so our, our uh, intel research specialists, our, our intel folks, are they play a critical role um, without them. Uh, if things wouldn't run the way they should, uh, um, at least every field office has several uh, intel research specialists um, um, assigned to them, and then also our national response team has intel research uh, specialists assigned. Uh, how do we implement them into these types of investigations? They do a lot with the uh, social media collection of data uh, there and analysis. Um, they help us uh, significantly with our timeline development and uh, uh, some of our mapping um, as well. And then the uh, you know the obvious uh, suspect queries, uh, license plate queries, vehicle queries, things to that nature. Just uh, the actual intel gathering. Um, uh, you know, on specific leads that are coming in, tips that are coming in. So we typically, uh, uh, on a normal call out, we'll go with one Intel research specialist. I can, I can tell you uh, out in the Twin Cities, I think we had uh, three or four of them uh, assigned and working with us. So very critical role. Great question. And uh, the second half, actually, you sounded like you kind of answered it, but if you, maybe you can expound on what kinds of tasks do you assign to those folks and, and how does that support the mission? Yeah, I mean, that's a, I think I, I did hit both of those right on the front end. So they're doing the obvious, uh, you know, the suspect, uh, you know, backgrounds for us, queries, things like that. So again, they, they help us with our, our mapping timelines and social media inquiries, uh, case organization, things like that. Excellent. Chief Bayshore, uh, what are your thoughts on securing the fire stations that are in the hot zone? <laughs> Asking, had to get back to the right screen. Um, so two things. One, if they have to operate in the hot zone, then that has to be under armed guard. And there's gonna be people that go, you're crazy. Well, no, I'm not. If they have to operate in, a, in, a, in the hot zone. Um, when I did those NFPA missions in both China and Brazil, every one of their fire stations is guarded by an armed guard, by a, a fence and an armed guard. That's just a way of life for them. So if it has to happen, that's my suggestion. Uh, ultimately, if it's a hot zone, they need to get out of there. That's not what we do. We're not, um, uh, uh, operating on a daily basis where we sleep, eat, and do all the things that, that go in between all those calls, uh, they need to be in a safer area to be able to do that. That would be like asking uh, the law enforcement people to take their break in that hot zone as well, which some of them are probably rolling their eyes at me, and that's okay. Um, so I say get out, but if you have to be there, it has to be under armed guard. Great answer. Let's see, I, I addressed the uh, uh, presentation copy, so, uh, what are some programs, I'm not sure who, to, who wants to address this best, uh, what are some programs and grants to attain body armor for active assailant and civil unrest events? Anyone I don't know as far as uh, Fire and EMS, I don't know what the current strategy says for the Fire Act grant, but the, the Fire Act has typically been where uh, uh, people go uh, on the operation side to be able to get that. I'm just not sure whether it's a priority this year and somebody else may be able to answer that better. Actually, most of them will probably close out for this cycle, but. Okay. I don't have any uh, information on my side of the house for that. That'll be something we'll have to look into. Um, Seth, I think this one would go towards you. Um, are we seeing an uptick in Molotov cocktails against first responders or primarily the buildings? So um, in response to that, I, I don't know what an uptick, uptick would really be. I do know um, that we encountered a lot of devices uh, in these um, 
uh, during these events. Um, Molotovs were, you know, uh, found at numerous businesses, uh, vehicles uh, throughout the, the country of various designs. In fact, um, a couple times we could call, uh, we could say uh, the fire department actually encountered some caches or already pre-staged uh, uh, Molotovs that were, you know, sitting in location. So um, is there an uptick? I don't know what we're comparing it to, but I can tell you that, yes, we found uh, numerous uh, devices that, that meet the definition of a Molotov, uh, at least for the federal definition, breakable uh, bottle, ignitable liquid, and a wick. Excellent. Um, looks like we're coming back to you again. Oh, and something just happened on my screen. <laughs> All right. Well, Okay. Do, do we track civil unrest fires versus business owners taking advantage of civil unrest, arson for profit? Um, so uh, the, the delineation between the two, I'm sure we do. I'm not sure of the actual, uh, um, you know, how many of those occurred during the, 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 the last events. Um, uh, I do know uh, we had some during the 2016 Milwaukee riots, we had some business owners trying to take advantage of the actual civil unrest uh, that were involved with setting their own uh, businesses on fire, um, trying to uh, collect profit on that. Um, you know, that was one of, of our concerns with uh, the coronavirus um, and, you know, uh, what were the conditions of the businesses? Was there, you know, loss in sales, et cetera, that would be put uh, folks in financial duress. Um, you know, at this point, I do know we delineate between the two. We're always looking for outliers. Um, we don't immediately have a bias and say that, you know, every fire is, a, is a attributed to, uh, you know, rioting um, that actual uh, uh, business owners may be involved. So we do look at that side of the, uh, the, the, the uh, pendulum or investigation. Thank you. I have a question also. It's, uh, I'll have to do some research on this. I'm not quite familiar. Does Enfers track civil unrest fires? I'm sure that the Enfers records certain aspects that are garnered um, from these incidents, but I'm not exactly sure where they are with actual civil unrest. So I'll work on trying to uh, locate that information and I'll respond directly to you, sir. And well, that pretty much wipes out all the questions. And we have an answer from Craig Herman who says Infers does not track that specifically. So, uh, and it doesn't mean it won't in the future. Um, anytime you do have any question of that type of sort, you can always go to the usfa.fema.gov website and you can go under the Enfers column and you can pose questions that are specific to something you're looking for, trying to do research on, and they can um, work on that topic. And uh, it's something that um, is of great value that's gonna assist the nation, then they'll definitely work on trying to come up with that data. And uh, well, I think this probably draws the conclusion for today's presentation. I wanna thank all four of our, or three of our presented, presenters on, um, or four actually. <laughs> John didn't pop back on here, I just realized that. Um, but I'm just uh, grateful for your dynamic presentations. You really hit it out of the park. And uh, you know, Arson Awareness Week is definitely uh, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts. And you know, it's something we have to consider when it comes to you know, going out, responding to these events and getting home back and safe to our families. So I thank all of our supporters. I thank all of our viewers and I'll work on getting all the uh, presentation copies out to everyone as quickly as possible. And uh, once again, thank you one and all. Have a great day. Thanks, Bruce.